Thank you, uh, Professor Parikh, for your invitation. And secondly, thanks, organizers, for such a long introduction. I was not expecting that, but you covered a lot of ground, and thank you for that. Um, firstly, you know, as you all know, I moved to Australia nearly 40 years back. And you can see the Indian rug on the back because it was so good that I didn't want it to put on the floor. So that's my sign of being Indianness here. Now, I will simply move on to my topic by sharing my slides and I keep on talking, okay? Please wait. Okay, all good? So the topic of my presentation today is health of the planet, the big picture, and what planet means. The biosphere, which includes humans and plants and the environment, because the health of each component is integrated to be each other, right? So before I move on to more, I will just want to spend one or two minutes about my research. So this is our lab pre-pandemic. We used to have a lot of people and Professor Parikh has visited a few times and he gave excellent presentations here as well. And we, we hope to see him again once the Australia opens up. But now we are closed from nearly one year. But we don't have a but fortunately, we don't have a, you know, COVID as such because we closed the country. Now, my research has, uh, focuses on reproduction, reproductive biology, reproduction, flowering, allergies, you know, and so forth. And uh, of course, lately, uh, we have been working on a couple of collaborative projects with international collaborate, collaborators. And this is a project on quinoa flowering, which are working in collaboration with colleagues in Chile. And uh, so if you want to look at the full article, uh, article is there. And uh, recently we were in the news again uh, about our project on uh, making pollen grains more heat tolerant because it is the reproductive stage in the plants, which is most susceptible to heat. And this article was produced by Melbourne University, who is quite good in, you know, giving a popular articles. And I even got uh, yesterday, your articles have received so many hits from Australia, USA, India. I like to see more from India. So the click is there for you guys. Take my hint, please. So, okay, so we move on to the, our lecture for today. When I was doing uh, all this research, about 2007, the University of Melbourne decided to generate or develop new subjects, which should be available to every student in the university, elective, whether they're doing arts degree or music degree, or agriculture or engineering. And that's a challenging to develop such a subject, which would be interesting to everyone. So I put a proposal for this subject, food for a healthy planet, because food is something important for everyone, you know, whether you're an engineer or an artist or anybody. So this got approved and this got so successful that taken me off of my research for a long, you know, affected my that part. But on the other hand, it's a very rewarding experience as Professor Parikh has visited many years ago when we, I was giving a lecture in a big lecture theater and we have 500 to 600 students and 100 students from basically Bachelor of Arts degree, some from even music and so forth. And so we try to cover the topical issues which are important for today. And let me say this thing. We started this subject in 2008 and those 
issues which are covered in this subject as are becoming more and more important right now in march 2019 there was a whole issue of the magazine the economist which talks about climate change and population growth groundwater depletion disputes over water and this is something we have been covering for so many years and it is becoming so so important so my lecture is going to cover about climate change food a um, little bit about functional foods and so forth because i give basically 12 lectures this subject is spread over two series food for healthy planet 1 and 2 and uh, so we have total 48 lecture subject so i gave about quarter of them myself and so it was difficult when professor parik asked me to give a lecture food for a healthy planet you know can i give 12 lectures no so how to compress it so i taken slides from here and there from my 12 lectures and try to weave something which will fit in 50 minute to 1 hour and uh, so hopefully you'll find something very useful this is the slides i give to my in fact i um, our semester started yesterday and i gave a similar presentation yesterday and tomorrow i'm giving presentation so fortunately i don't have a lectures in my university on tuesday so which worked fine for and when professor pari called me so let's move on first thing i want to say that we as a humans are affecting the environment that much so the current era you know geological era paleozoic and so forth we have all a geological era so paul krutzen is a nobel laureate from germany and he called he named the word anthropocene anthropo means human human era and you can see from all the images from the article what humans are doing to the planet you know digging everything you know making cities dams you know fires this is all human activity okay so it's saying are humans now overwhelming the great forces of nature yes they are and there's a big big challenge for us how can we survive you know as a humanity by attacking the nature okay so the biosphere shaped by humanity right and one thing which strikes me and this was a, a graphic produced in a anthropocene review and you look at those socio economic and earth system trends we call it great acceleration you can see on the top left world population is growing urban population is growing water use is growing right but what happening to the earth when we are doing all those things carbon dioxide nitrous oxide stratospheric ozone all those um you know um things are growing so what we where are we going to end up with this this started only from only from about 100 years back so where is the end are we going to you know grow ourselves into oblivion as a humanity this is a big risk for us and you look at fertilizer consumption huge now you look at 1950 we were only 2.5 billion people on the planet and i was not born long after 50 maybe there were 3 billion and now about 7.5 and we are ending ending towards 9.2 to 10 nobody knows it's a modeling but you can see here you know graph how little was the population till middle ages and then only last 100 to 150 years it has exploded one of the reason the population has exploded is uh, availability of artificial fertilizers 
And in fact, the Nature magazine in 1999 produced a special issue on most influential persons of the 20th century because 1999 century was finishing. And I, I have to agree that I had no idea because like, like you or anybody else, I would have said Gandhi, Einstein, Hitler, so forth. No, it wasn't. It was actually Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, two chemists who invented the process of taking nitrogen from air and combining with hydrogen under great pressure and then make ammonia. Then from ammonia, you can make nitrate as a solidified fertilizer, taking air from nitrogen from the air and making a solid fertilizer. And what happened? That changed the world. And that happened in 1908, filed a patent, synthesis of ammonia from its element and, and awarded Nobel Prize in chemistry. And this article published in Nature Geoscience says, a hundred years on, we live in a world transformed by and highly dependent on Haber-Bosch nitrogen. What that means, you go back to 1918 when this process was patented and suddenly we have production of this fertilizer. And what happens when you have this fertilizer, suddenly it really exploded plant product, crop productivity with artificial fertilizers. And it has been modeled that if we didn't have this kind of process and if we were depending just organic fertilizers or manures, today the population will be, you know, something here. But now, so you can see process invented. But I was fascinated to see that 8,000 years before Christ, which is about 10,000 years back, there are only 5 million people in the whole planet. Imagine how many people are there in Delhi? 25, 30 million? I do not know, but, but even the whole planet had, maybe whole Chandigarh population where you are is like that. So this was the global population. And we are just growing like anything. Now, interesting part is that um, when you put nitrogen, it's, nitrogen has to be affordable. Poor people, poor farmers can't afford that much fertilizers. And in some countries, like India, you can see green. Sometimes farmers are putting excess nitrogen, okay? Because they have no idea how much is really needed unless, and I know the government, India is now, developing a lot of programs on soil testing and all those things. And also the modern technologies of uh, aerial mapping is available now, but let's look at excess nitrogen pollutes the waterways and releases greenhouse gases, right? So this is a, again, a challenge for us. So going back to 1968, when we didn't have that much crop production, there were worldwide famines started and the Stanford population biologist, Paul Eric published a book, Population Bomb, okay? So he says, control the population or race to oblivion. And population control was something of, you know, important to India as well in 70s but it all fizzled in a way. And it, one of the reason was that suddenly we had this green revolution. So it's the plant biologist, it's the plant people researcher who saved the planet because Norman Borlaug developed dwarf varieties of wheat. And this is shown here, rice in any case. So the dwarf varieties, what they do, the normal varieties were tall, you know, and uh, so the improved dwarf varieties put a lot of their photosynthate into 
heading seeds you know reproductive parts so here you can see here you know uh, if normal varieties and improved and in fact when i was a, i was actually i got early education in punjab agricultural university in ludhiana and that was the time when green revolution was in a big swing and farmers were coming you know getting seeds from our university and you know very exciting period however green revolution is good save 1.3 billion people from starvation but green revolution is also now you know struggling why is that okay a little bit of science here that um when they develop those uh, dwarf varieties so two two less dwarf rst means reduced height so reduced height if it's too reduced it can't make enough photosynthate okay if it is too high it's basically making tall stems so this was kind of uh, variant which was decided but let's not worry too much about science here the problem with the green revolution is we have high yielding varieties corn rice wheat but the issue is they need a lot of fertilizers pesticides and water okay a lot of water fossil fuels now basically people say that we are indirectly eating fossil fuel because all our farm machinery you know working on the farm off the farm transporting of food you know produce is all uses diesel petrol you know fuel fossil fuel now we have a issue here what happens if we run out of fossil fuel because fossil fuel is not a infinite resource it has been you know estimated that um world might run out of you know great source of fuel in 50 to 60 years from now so there's a huge challenges for us also as um so those varieties again this is a paper published last year and i, I he says green revolution stumbles in dry environment because dwarf wheat which was good in the high rainfall site which was lot of lot of um, you can say um water irrigation even they work fine but when the low rainfall site in drought conditions they not longer performing so we had to re look at the whole thing it's a big challenge right now in any case uh um, you look at the major stressors for future food production how to feed 9.5 to 10 billion people in future there are a lot of elements here and normally i spend two three lectures but i will just take few ideas from here climate change food waste and um, water usage and i'll spend only some time on those things now as um professor parik said climate change is real and climate change has going to have a big impact on our food supply because hotter climate is going to reduce yield okay stressed 1.8 degree fahrenheit or 1 degree celsius can reduce yield by 10% it's a significant yield reduction secondly we are using enormous amount of water remember people say we have a lot of water on the planet no only 1% of the water 1.5% of the total water is a fresh water and and 1% of that 1.5% is available for human use so when world population is growing as you can see on the top the water withdrawal is growing irrigation area is growing so 
again, we are stressing the planet by trying to grow more food for the growing population. Well, ice melting. You, a lot of you can appreciate that when you have a Ganges in India and Indus River and Yangtze River in China, the water flows in the summer because the mountain glaciers which accumulate ice during the cold weather over the years, there's a constant melting and there is a water available for agriculture. Those canals in Punjab and everywhere, they come from, this is the water resource. So if climate change is happening too quick, the water is you know, melting too fast before there is a, any, you know, new mo no more ice, we are risking running out of water in the meantime, long term. And this is going to be a problem. And, and you have seen this, what is happening. I watch news, what's happening in India, in Uttarakhand on 7th of February, when the Himalayan glacier broke. And this, the earlier photo was, I used to show in 2008. And this is all happening right in front of our eyes, you know. So we have stressed food environment. And secondly, irrigation. Those of you in Chandigarh, Punjab, wherever you are, you have seen, you can relate to this. Those big electrical pumps um, sucking out water, underground water, because there is a water, because not all the rainwater stays there, it seeps down and we, we you know, what to say, tube wells put the water out. But what happens if we take the water out too quickly before it replenishes? Replenishing takes a long time. And then we dig further deeper. Further deeper is a fossil water which is all which is you know um, is not even replenishable because so far below in the rocks so we are you know pumping them out and in as the article this was in scientific american and I, it says in some states of india half of the available electricity is used to pump water this water is not infinite resource it can dry up water. So water table can decline. This is this happening. This is the issue. And one of the main problem also is that the kind of crops we grow. And let's look at water footprint of food production. You need to, to produce one kilogram of the product. You need that much water. So of course, meat production is very water intensive. Beef, rice, 3300 approximation. So I mean half of that, the beans are half of that. But we are producing in a lot of parts of the world, even in India, Punjab, the rice, which is a highly water intensive crop on irrigated water, unless we have a better rice variety, as like Professor Parikh is coming up with strong rice, and I, I'm sure that um, needs less water, but our priorities also had to depend. But I, I'll focus on soybean for a minute. Now, soybean is interesting because, or, or any beans or pulses, legumes, because legumes, this is the root nodules. They can fix their own nitrogen. They don't need that much artificial nitrogen fertilizer. And legumes or pulses need less water as compared to rice. So I was thinking only yesterday when I was putting these slides together, why don't they grow more pulses in India? And I found immediately I searched and I found very interesting. Yeah, there is something happening. So it's interesting. Pulses are 
not only important for sustainability, because every time you grow legume crop, it increases the nitrogen in the soil, right? And also the organic matter. So they are very important crops, but, but for India, they're important for totally different purpose. We're talking about protein gap, right? So here we have, um, we need more food for growing population. And by 2040, we expected that humans will be eating about 100 grams of protein per person per day, right? So we need 400 million tons of protein per year. How are we gonna grow this? How's to fill the gap? By, so the sources of protein are up there, plant, meat, dairy, seafood, and other animals, okay? So how are we gonna fill this gap? Meat, more meat? No, because we have a big problem with the meat production, I tell you. Of course, meat production has been increasing more than fivefold since 1950. This is a FAO, so first 50 years, 20 years back. The problem, what is happening now? Humans are becoming more carnivorous. Of course, happening in India as well. Study reveals global shift towards animal-based diet, but it's a bad omen for the environment because every time humans, see, this is vegetarians, as most of Indians are, you know, we live on, primary producers are crops. Crops fix, you know, photosynthesis, crops convert solar energy, plants. So we all live on plants, right? Plants are the primary producers, right? So if we live on crops or plants, we are doing good. But what happens if we jump up the trophic level? If we jump up, if we, if we think our food has to come from cattle or meat, we are losing more than 90% of energy because cattle have to live, breed over the time, grow, and you extract some meat, but you lost most of the energy. Only 1% goes up to the next trophic level. So when you become a secondary consumer, right? So this is a issue. A lot of humans are becoming secondary consumers. Well, interesting point is meat production this is the more latest one, uh, more growing in Asia, which includes probably India uh, here. In Europe, North America is kind of constant. They're always, Europe and North America, they're always a lot of meat eaters, but meat eating is growing in, you know, third part of the world. But this is an article in Proceeding National Academy of Sciences. It says, many more people could be fed by grain used to feed the cattle than can be fed by cattle themselves. You look at this. This is the feed given to poultry for eggs, okay? So quite a bit, eggs are pretty good. Poultry is still good. A lot of it's wasted. Conversion loss, this much energy and feed is lost. Only this much is lost in conventional food loss, we lose food, but this much is saved. Pretty good, poultry is much better. But look at meat like beef. Basically, most of the energy, primary produ production feed is lost. We get very little, 1% of actually as a food. And however, the article says, if we replace by plant replacements, now we will save most of the, that energy and primary production. So we simply cannot feed humanity by feeding this kind of 
meat, okay? This is still more sustainable as compared to this, right? But then there are degrees differences. This is an American cartoon, but I just want to show you that if we live on a standard American diet, which is a lot of meat, you need a lot more, um, you know, land to feed one person per year. And if you have plant-based diet, protein, the reality is nobody's suggesting people should only eat plant-based diet. Nobody's suggesting animal-based. People are now advocating predominantly plant. That's the kind of wisdom these days. Because, but if, if you look at trophic level, the trophic level goes from one to five. So humans are, you know, not that high, 2.25, 2.5, because in some countries uh, here, um, the, um, the lot of meat eating trophic level is high. And this is the middle. It was in the less because India and China were less meat eaters. Um, I guess India is much less than this, but they combined somehow in this diagram, but we're heading towards there. And it tells you trophic levels, you know, of the, right? So the problem is the energy needed to produce meat is huge. A lot of greenhouse gases are produced, okay? So if you compare with greenhouse gas emission impact, per gram of protein, okay? We want to get protein. Protein is, because people eat meat because they say this is fantastic source of protein, but plants are equally good, okay? It's not big difference. It just sometimes we eat meat because of texture and taste and so forth. So you look at here, the impact of uh, greenhouse gas emissions per gram of protein, very high for lamb, goat, beef, medium for poultry, which is much more sustainable, I told you, egg, poult. So this is, we have to think about, and also the cost, you know, can we afford that much? So there is a lot of, um, right now, particularly in USA, there is a lot of emphasis on making at least plant-based meats, which is basically they convert the uh, protein taken from peas, mature peas, legumes, and convert or, or you know, process them so they taste like meat. And I have tried it. It's pretty good. And also, I was looking yesterday, there are also people go and buy those nuggets from McDonald's and they have produced protein-based, blend of protein-based isolate and flaxseed, these nuggets from plant protein. And I was reading the articles and a lot of them are saying, hard to tell they are not chicken. So uh, maybe there is, in fact, why these people are having these kind of things. It's, it's a processed food, right? But to wean people off from meat, maybe you had to give them a processed food which tastes like meat, looks like meat. And uh, so it's quite still better than um, getting protein directly from animal sources. I will shift my topic because I've taken slides from different lectures and I'm, you know, uh, another thing is food waste. How much food do we waste? right? It's a wasted food. How, and it has been estimated that hum, we as a humanity, 700 peop, uh, million people go hungry every night. Huge number of, you know, hunger globally. But we waste that much food as well. Of course, it's not possible to transport particularly fresh food from to people where they're hungry. But Let's talk about food waste. So a significant share of food 
intended for human consumption is lost between the farm and the fork, okay? So we have 32% global supply by weight, 24% by calories. That much food is wasted. And there is a great emphasis right now in stopping the food waste, okay? And food wastage happens in different parts of the value chain in production, right? Handling and storage, processing, distribution and market, consumption. So wastage, when it happens, it happens in a different situations. I, I would say in, in, in India, a lot of wastage happens here, earlier parts. And in developed world, a lot of wastage happens in here. Marketing, consumption. People buy excess food because food is cheaper in developed world. And um, so depends on if you are in a developed, more developed, richer countries, you spend only 10% or 8% of your income on food. In a country like India, I'm not saying individuals, you know, some people earn more, about 60% of the income goes into the food. Here we spend 8%. So food is cheaper. We buy a lot of food and then we throw it away. It's criminal. Of course, in Melbourne, here and there, there are a lot of charities have come up which collect leftover breads, leftover um, you know, um, vegetables from the supermarkets free. And then they make foods and then they serve poor people. In fact, uh, since in the pandemic period, we have a lot of overseas students who are stuck here could, and they lost their scholarships. And so the second bite was providing you know, nutritious foods because they were collecting excess food from the supermarket. But this is not going to help that much. This is a local solution, but still a, still a very interesting, reduce some wastage, right? But not much. So we have to do something about this food wastage. What happens if we convert this food into protein? Now, and what are the, who are the best converters of food into protein? It is not chicken. It is not beef. It is actually insects. Here you are, insect larvae. They are the best converters of food into protein. Now, we may feel repelled from it, but globally, a lot of companies are coming up. This is a startup company in Netherlands who are actually uh, making insect protein processing plant products. They basically take the waste food, feed to the larvae, and then freeze dry the larvae, powder it, and sorry, they don't give to humans yet. That's not I'm suggesting. This protein powder is used for feeding animals or fisheries because when you do um, uh, culturing the fish, in the, uh, what say, in the ponds, they need to be fed protein. So waste food, there's a great emphasis on recycling and insects converting waste food by insects to proteins and feeding them to then animals is becoming a important part of the solution. And this is happening all over the world in last, basically very new, last three to five years, a lot of companies are coming up you know, all over the world. But I'm switch on again to a different lecture. I'm just spent some time on double burden. When we say, 795 million people are hungry every day, one tenth, right? On the other hand, 1.9 billion people are overweight and obese. So either we have, don't have enough food or we consume too much food. And I'll just focus something on micronutrient deficiency. Micronutrients, of course, you know, vitamins and minerals, which, you know, 
basically are required in a very small amount, micrograms, nanograms for our food. And so-called Western food is pretty bad in these micronutrients. So micronutrients are vitamins, okay, minerals, iron, all those things. I'm not going to give you here a basic chemistry lesson, but just say micronutrients, small molecules. But interesting part is that micronutrient deficiencies affect a lot of health. health immunity, stunted growth, lower productivity, lower cognitive ability, brain development, reproduction. So this is, even you get enough food in terms of calories, eat a lot of rice, you may not be getting right amount of micronutrients. And that's a, we call it a hidden hunger, okay? Here is the uh, interesting point here. On the left, there's a rice. On the right, there is salad with a mix of different things. And they are equivalent in calories. Each dish carries the same calories. One carries vitamins necessary for growth and development. This one doesn't. Rice on its own is a wonderful source of carbohydrates and some proteins, but lacks anything else. So if the poor people only eating rice, they are deprived of very important micronutrients that affects their even ability, even mental ability, okay? So, so this is again, a, as Professor Parikh was saying, nutrition. So it's not only food. We are shifting from worrying about food. We are moving to nutrition. And billions of people are affected by iron deficiency. And you can see, you know, um, sphere in this part of the world. And um, overall, you can see iron deficiency, iodine, 3 billion people are affected. But I will spend a little bit of time on vitamin D because this is very interesting. Vitamin D is basically body can make your own vitamin D by exposing to sunlight, okay? So in our skin, uh, dehydrocholesterol can go down to by uh, UV light to vitamin D, okay, here, pathway. Or vitamin D also a little bit comes from diet, dietary sources, you know. But if you look at when we believe that our skin can, you know, um, synthesize vitamin D, how much we expose ourselves to sun? Look at the human factors. Exposure, sunscreen, degree of melanin concentration. If my skin is more darker, it is filtering out the light, not letting go down in the cells. So we're not getting enough vitamin D. And you'll be surprised that mostly Indians in India, uh, maybe two thirds of Indians are strongly deficient in vitamin D. And vitamin D deficiency has a big um, effect because lack of vitamin D can lead to diabetes, depression, uh, metabolic syndrome, so forth. I cannot go into that, but something, something one should look at and something you should remember that, um, um, you know, I now tell my, it's very interesting. I'm getting students coming from India, postgraduate students, and they very feeling, you know, less energetic or so forth. And I tell them, go and test, get your tested. And some of them came, they have 15 units. It has to be 70, 80. So this is something, a big problem in, in also, and also because of pollution, the, the solar radiation, the wavelength is not coming down, okay? So sun deprived, this was in Beijing, 
in India. So one has to be careful. Also, um, you all heard about biofortified foods, vitamin A, golden rice, antioxidant rich tomatoes. This is genetic means, plant means of, um, you know, making food which has itself a lot of micronutrients, right? And I will spend only, so this is my different lecture in pursuit of good health. And I've just picked up five or six slides because I know you're going to talk about functional foods. I looked at your program and I just spent on functional foods. Okay. So let's say, what's food? You always remember, those of you are plant scientists, be pleased that the meat in our diet come from animals that eat plants. Plants are the primary producers. Okay. That's no doubt about it. I just think, why we made our food choices, right? Okay, a lot of it's economic reason. You know, sometimes we can't afford to buy. Interesting thing I, I noticed was the, the bad food is cheaper, more tastier food is cheaper, right? So you, if, if you are on an economically lower uh, you know, level, you end up eating more bad food. A simple example is if I go to supermarket here, the meat I buy, the one which has a lot of fat is $4 a kilo. The one which is called, you know, slim or, or you know, it has less fat is $12, three times more expensive. So if you can't afford it, you're eating food, not right kind of food, okay? And sometimes there's a lot of marketing also. Also, we don't eat food simply because we are hungry. Psychological reasons. When we are stressed, we eat food, tired, okay? All those reasons for eating food. So you can all, um, you can say, relate to it. But these functional foods was term introduced in Japan in mid 80s. And they refer to processed foods containing added ingredients that aid specific bodily functions. And some of, because all the, first of all, all the food has a function. There is no food without function. Why they call it functional foods? Separate meta. But they add something extra and sell as a, uh, you know, health promoting, probiotic, or add extra fiber, okay? or extra protein, digestive, so forth. A lot of it's marketing than the reality. And the whole idea came from Japan because Japan, there are so many foods are labeled foshu, foods for specified health use. They're saying this is good for, you know, they put plant sterols and uh, into milk. It reduces the absorption of real you know, you know, cholesterol, it might help, okay, so forth. But, but this thing, functional food has a problem. Problem is, in Japan, they made those Pepsi Cola, and which is, has an artificial sweetener or too much sugar as well, maybe. And they put some fiber in it, you know, plant fibers, and they say it's a functional food because it has a fiber. Because you want small amount of fiber, you are eating, you are drinking a lot of you know, sugar drinking, artificial or artificial sweeteners or other chemicals. This is not a functional food. It is like when I go to supermarket, they used to say 95% mm, fat free. What that means? But it has less fat, but it has a lot of sugar. And if I eat that, that sugar will be converted to fat in my body. So one has to be very careful what is functional or marketing. And so I hope this kind of fast marketing doesn't come to India now. We have seen that a lot of getting people are getting put off from this. Because if you want functional food, maybe you look at 
phyto plant nutrients. So plants produce secondary metabolites, alkaloids, tannins, coumarins, quinones, and they're not essential for human health, but they have some health benefits. For example, fruits and vegetables have got very important bioactive compounds, lycopene, okay, in tomatoes, turmeric has, so isoflavones in soybeans, glucosinolates in uh, cruciferous foods, resveratrol in grapes. So they all have, they all have some health giving properties. So they are nature's functional foods, right? For, for example, um, it has been shown that daily fruit and vegetables may decrease incidence of cardiovascular disease, right? So that's what the problem is. If you cannot afford all these things, and if you can only afford rice, is a health, is a problem. Now, the mechanisms by which plant foods protect against cardiovascular disease are uncertain, but they might protect from oxidative stress. And Professor Parikh knows all about oxidative stress. He works on plant stress, but, uh, or they may uh, reduce plaque formation in the arteries, which, the, um, which um, you know, basically uh, makes your arteries thinner. And I show to my students and they get surprised. This is the normal artery, okay? And this is the block with the plaque in it. And, and what happens? When a heart has to pump the blood through these narrow arteries, it has to put a lot of pressure. That is called hypertension, blood pressure. If our arteries are clean like this, no problem of blood pressure. And if clot happens in the brain, this kind of clot or this kind of blockage, you get stroke. Because when blood stops flowing, brain doesn't receive oxygen, brain cells in the area die and permanent damage is done. Okay, so a uh, lot of those plant foods are, are good for you know us. And uh, I was um, reading this, article, a newspaper, uh, sorry, book by Sanjay Gupta, he's a uh, CNN correspondent in medical correspondent in USA. And if you watch American news, CNN, you see him all the time talking about COVID-19. It's a very smart guy. So, so he just published a book called Keep Shop, Build a Better Brain at Any Age. I'm getting old. I need some, how to keep my brain sharp. So I found his interesting articles. He, he, he talks about uh, interesting issue about curcumin, which is uh, what you say uh, in, from Indian curry, right? So which you call India Haldi, turmeric. So it has been shown, this guy in UCLA, he's been working on this thing. He says that uh, it protects it's antioxidant and anti-inflammatory protects um, from Alzheimer's disease and gives better cognitive performance. So, and these, and a lot of research is going on and they think, and I had no idea, they think India, senior citizen India has a less Alzheimer's disease as compared to Western. And they think they eat a lot of your curries. So better after your Enjoy a lot of curry with, you know, uh, your turmeric to keep your brain sharp. So this is interesting. I'm not selling this book or anything, but I found very, very interesting. This is something we use normally anyway. So it is some other people now finding, you know, medical benefits, which may be traditional knowledge in some countries people already know and they, they're already doing it. Okay. But so this is interesting. But so basically, I will conclude here. I had to just take a slide from my different lectures. And in the end about food, so for millions of years, humans have evolved to be broad, 
opportunistic eaters of diverse low calorie plant based diets that's where we originated from but what happens modern diets contain too much of wrong kind of foods ultra processed foods sometimes foods being sold as functional foods which has one good ingredient and 20 bad ones okay so excess sugar leads to health problems many stemming from obesity so my lecture basically started from climate change to nutrition because normally this is equal to 10 different lectures so here we are we try to give you something a taste of what we do and i finish my lecture here and i'm open for questions thank you